What will your future look like? The job you do today could be different than the jobs of tomorrow. Some see this as a challenge. At UCF, we see opportunity. A chance for you to grow your knowledge and strengthen your skills from anywhere life might take you. With in-demand degree programs and resources for your success, UCF Online can help you prepare for the future and all the possibilities that come with it. From the University of Central Florida's Center for Distributed Learning, I'm Tom Cavanaugh. And I am Kelvin Thompson. And you are listening to TopCast, the teaching online podcast. I appreciate the orientation. Uh, yeah, and for I those who are watching on video, sometimes. you may need a little visual aid here. My visual aid is that we're watching classic Doctor Who. Oh my gosh, that is classic Doctor Who. Yeah. It looks very disco. Yeah, the 70s, that was Tom Baker. You know, this artwork is kind of cool. It comes off the back, it was recreated off the back of cereal boxes from the 70s. Uh, Weetabix was like this English cereal, and they would, uh, you'd cut out the little cardboard things off the back, and that was some artist made these characters from Doctor Who, and then they made it into a mug, and now I'm drinking coffee out of it. Well, that's a, that's a deep cut. Kelvin, especially yeah. for somebody like me who knows pretty much nothing about Doctor Who. But you got a Topcast mug, and I give you complete <laughs> props for that, because uh, you're on brand. Thank Way you. to go, Tom. Thank you. Hey, you want to talk about other nerd stuff, I'm in. You know, Harry Potter, Star Wars, Star Trek, Lord mm -hmm. of the Rings. Yeah, I got my nerd cred for that, but I'm just not, mm -hmm. never gotten into Doctor Who. Yeah, well, there's hope for you yet. I, I'm holding out hope. <laughs> well, you know, we've shown the mugs. Uh, why don't we talk about what's in it? Uh, what, what is sure. in the thermos? What am I drinking? Well, uh, Tom, today's coffee is a single origin Kenya from Bones Coffee Company in Cape Coral, Florida. We have featured coffees from Kenya a handful of times in past episodes. And, and from Bones uh, as well. Yes, and other coffees from Bones as well. That's right. We have commented previously that Kenyan coffees are generally regarded as some of the best in the world. Some listeners will be familiar with seeing or hearing of Kenya AA coffee. Uh, fun fact, AA is part of the Kenyan coffee classification scheme. It basically refers to the size of the bean. So that's kind of analogous to the egg classification in the U.S. where you might find grade A eggs in the grocery store. And, you know, it seems to me that classifications help us make sense of phenomena, but they're only part of the story. Quality is more complex, and studying the nature of what makes something better or worse is hard but important work. There are all manners of reasons why Kenyan coffees are considered good. So how's the coffee and could you find a connection in there somewhere to today's topic? Uh, I like the coffee, it's good. Um, I got it froofed up but it's still pretty strong, Whiskey. I can taste it. Um, Whiskey? <laughs> no, give me give me a couple hours till five o'clock, and then maybe um, <laughs> it's been that milk. kind of a day, Kelvin, as you might know. That's yeah, right. Right. Um, but I I think the connection is about as good as the coffee. I think I get it. Ooh. Yeah, by I thought George. you were insulting the coffee there for a no, second. No, 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 no. I'm, in, I'm uh, yeah complimenting your connection. Oh, thank All you. All right, so you you mentioned something about best in the world. Yeah, and uh, and classifying things as you know better or mm -hmm. worse and how do we know mm -hmm. something's good and mm -hmm. I think all of that relates to our guest today that's right so um, I would say that our guest is among the best in the world at what she does Absolutely. and I would say that she's super helpful to us and to others in the industry at helping us to determine what is good and better and to evaluate things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's right so, uh, with no further ado, uh, today we are joined live uh, in our recording by our very own UCF colleague, Dr. Patsy Moskal. Hello, Patsy. Patsy, w welcome. Hello, how are you? Good. And so, while many of our listeners might be familiar with Patsy from her work in our field, or the many times we have invoked her name on this very it's podcast, so true. We could go. We could go through and tally those. I know. Yeah, it's a lot. I, yeah. I, I'm waiting for the royalty check to arrive. <laughs> yeah, Me too. So are we. <laughs> <laughs> so we should provide a little bit of context uh, with a little bit more of a, an official bio. Um, 
uh, you know, we'll do a little bit here, but we'll also put it on our, our show notes page as we do with all of our guests. So, Kelvin, you want to you wanna do a little more proper intro of Patsy? Yes, 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 yes. So, Dr. Patsy Moskal truly is world-renowned for her groundbreaking work in evaluating the impact of online, blended, and all manner of digital teaching and learning. Dr. Moskal currently serves as Director of Digital Learning Impact Evaluation at UCF's Research Initiative for Teaching Effectiveness within our Division of Digital Learning. And notably, Patsy Moskal has been doing this work since 1996 literally since the beginning of UCF's online initiative. Dr. Moskal has published many research articles and she is quite active in presenting within the events of our community's professional associations. She currently serves on the board of directors for the Online Learning Consortium and in 2011, Patsy Moskal was selected as a fellow of the Online Learning Consortium. Patsy, we're honored to have you join us today as we turn our attention back to a consideration of how we know whether our digital teaching and learning work is making a difference. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much. It's, a, it's an honor to be here with you. I have to tell you though, I'm not, I'm not with the coffee in the afternoon. Oh, crowd, I was going to ask so. you, what are you, what are you, what are you drinking? You went straight yeah, to the scotch. Yeah, no, no, I not, not you know, yet. I joke way like, too much about scotch. I only had scotch ever I, once in my life, and yeah, I didn't like it. I was going to say I'm getting a little worried because Kelvin keeps <laughs> mentioning the liquor, but um, and we can't really see what's inside that cup. But but no, I, I'm kind of a green tea in the afternoon mm, person. Yes. So yeah, co- you know, caffeine is uh, doesn't help with insomnia very much late. So yeah. Uh, I find that my my green tea is is a little better. So yeah. Gotcha. Well, you know, it occurs to me that um, all three of us are OLC fellows. This this is quite a, a fellowship we have going here. Uh, I don't know. This, is this the first time? It may not be the first time we've had fellows on the. Um, Chuck Jubin. Uh, we interviewed Chuck Jubin, yeah, Chuck but Obama. others as well, uh, depending upon the timing. <laughs> of, depending on the there timing. Are many, I think several of them are fellows now, if they weren't at the time. Charles we Graham, them. maybe? Is Charles a fellow? I don't have all of the fellows memorized. But we, have, but we, have <laughs> had, we have had Charles. I was thinking about kind of anywhere close to this, kind of this vein of yeah. like research and data and evaluation work. Um, and fellows. Yeah. Well, I bet others as well. But sure. so that's just an aside. Patsy, I want to jump in with something spicy. Oh, boy. All right. I got, just I got this spicy, spicy ginger green tea. That'll, that'll All right. do it. All right. That's perfect. It's I'm, thematic. I'm ready. <laughs> so this very morning, uh, as we are recording this, I looked in Inside Higher Ed, and there was an article that was talking about a new paper that has come out uh, that they called quote unquote rigorous um, from some folks at Auburn and some other places that examined online learning during the pandemic and Uh drew some broad conclusions, not just about what happened during the pandemic, but also in general online learning and and kind of, I'm I'm oversimplifying uh, to be fair, but kind of said, yeah, it's it's clear it's not as good as face to face. And um, of course, I've got my issues with that sort of, you know, what I call the great conflation between <laughs> emergency remote instruction and, um, and you know, well-designed, intentional, asynchronous online learning that we've always done. But I think it points to just how important it is that research is done to evaluate this objectively and, you know, and let the, the data fall where, where it may. But you've been doing this since the mid-90s. And I wonder if you could sort of comment on this phenomenon we're seeing coming out of the pandemic of, of people who've never really looked at online learning doing it now and, and any advice you might have for them as they do this sort of analysis. You just cash in your entire career and say, oops. Yeah. yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> I hope not. I, ho- I hope it, I hope it's actually the opposite. It's it's the ultimate in job security, right? So I mean, um, yeah, you're exactly right, Tom. I think that's not. I, I haven't read that particular article, but I've seen a number of references to, um, you know, what happened in the last year, and and one, you're exactly right. All of my colleagues that are also involved with evaluating online blended digital learning, um, you know, we are very cautiously looking at the last year. I mean, it, it, it was not our best, right? I mean, we all had to pivot um, well, at UCF in, in what, a week? 
less than a week. I mean, over we were fortunate we had spring break in there, right? So, um, you know, it you you do. I think it's there's a difference between survival um, transition and what what UCF has done, which is uh, you know intentionally set up the faculty development, the student and faculty support structures, um, and the evaluation unit to try to set, uh, really have a continuous improvement loop with our, with our online and blended learning, right? So, um, you know, it, that's really why it's important. I, I am always a, a, an annoying person who is, is talking about the importance of evaluation, why it's so important to have research established from the beginning, not after, you know, you, you don't want to, you don't want to try to uh, put it into place after the fact, because, because then you're, you're kind of stuck with what you're stuck with, and you're trying to get out ahead of some of these notions. But having, um, you know, having evaluation from the beginning, I mean, we are able to look at trends, look at, you know, systematic changes and, and actually s cycle that information back into improving the faculty development and, and so forth. I mean, heck, UCF, you said 1996 when we started offering online. One of the reasons we started offering blended learning was because our evaluation showed that so many of our students, we, we assumed that online would, would recruit students from afar. And in fact, we had students who were in, you know, in the library, on campus, you know, in, in labs, in their dorms. They were sitting on UCF's campus participating in online courses. And that's where the notion of, well, maybe we can do a, you know, a, a merger, best of both worlds, right? The online and face-to-face -face and, and capture a different um, instructional method. So I think the last year is very atypical of what we have seen historically in, um, you know, in online learning, in, in what you called quality online learning. And I think it's really important to differentiate that. I mean, I think the closest we might come is the few hurricanes Florida has had and the same kind of thing where you have a, a matter of, you know, a couple days if we're down, but I mean, we're not, we're not down. What are we 15, 16, 17 months? I mean, you know, some, some places are still remote. I mean, that's a long time to try to, to, to turn a very, you know, very big ship and you know it's like it is like moving a mountain and trying to get everyone on board all your faculty who may have never had any experience teaching online um, trying to help them learn all of those things that we have intentionally put into years of faculty development and required our faculty who teach our online courses to actually have that background and, and, and all that knowledge, not not just technology, but pedagogy. I mean, the pedagogy of how do you teach online? How do you reach those online students? Add to that, there's a complication. And I don't know from a, you know, from a research standpoint, how can you control for all the factors that impacted our students in the past mm -hmm. year? So a lot of those studies are looking at K-12 which in 99% of the cases is even less equipped to deal with online learning. Um, that's not what they do. We don't, we don't typically send our, majority of students don't go to a, um, you know, to a virtual school. It, it, those that do, they may experience it in high school, the last few years of high school, and they've already got a lot of years of learning. They already have some um, time management skills, some of the things that we expect our online learners to have. Um, and, you know, I mean, just dealing with COVID, I think we, we hear not just students, but faculty as well with, you know, struggling with the stress of the pandemic and um, concern over, you know, loved ones, friends, everyone else who either may be sick or out of work or have other issues, um, trying to do your studies and your work in a home where all of a sudden everyone in the family is trying to work and you may not have you know, the technology, the bandwidth, all of those things. So I think it's, it's to, to say that it's the same as what we really have been trying to, um, you know, conscientiously and methodically research for 25 years now, um, it, it's not. I mean, I don't yeah. think it is. So it's, it's a very different beast.
Yeah, and I, I think you make a good point about K-12 because I've been worried about that too. I, I think that objectively the K-12 experience has, has not been good in a lot of places for students. And, and we're all getting painted with that with that same brush. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think I'd, I'd like to maybe talk a little more uh, globally, maybe less specific to what, what's going on right now, kind of uh, comparing the, the pandemic experience to our traditional experience, but just maybe more generally. Um, so I think about, you know, times when I've used the, the work that you and, and Chuck have done, like when I've been challenged by faculty who have in their mind some preconceived notion that online is somehow inferior to face-to-face, and I can say, well, it's interesting you say that. Here are a bunch of data. <laughs> Here are studies, peer-reviewed studies and papers that have been produced by Patsy and Chuck uh, and others because these are generally research faculty, they're scientists, and they respond to, to data. And, and I wonder if you could kind of maybe talk a little bit about the importance of having objective, peer-reviewed data to, to kind of, not only for process improvement and, and for us to continually do better and improve, but to, to convince others from a rhetorical basis that that maybe they shouldn't be as concerned as maybe they are. Absolutely. Um, you know, we have we have a saying at UCF and uh, I think our, our our past CIO, now retired CIO, Joel Hartman, Dr. Joel Hartman used to say, um, you know, um, when in the absence of data, anecdote trumps. And that's exactly true. I mean, so many uh, faculty, you know, the, a rumor will get started and then spread like wildfire. And it, it's, it's tough to refute that unless you actually have some data um, in your back pocket. And, um, and obviously the quality of the research is really important and really critical to making those faculty, you know, refuting the faculty arguments, refuting the, the, those anecdotes that might get out there ahead of you. Um, and I think that that is why, you know, I think we we actually present to faculty and I, I would say context matters as well. So one of the things in addition to us doing our general um, evaluation of these courses and different kinds of technologies like adaptive learning and so forth at UCF, um, also helping facilitate faculty who are doing you know, research. So scholarship of teaching and learning, um, discipline-based um, educational research. I mean, those who are in, in the STEM fields, you know, if you're actually doing research in your field on your online courses or on your adaptive learning section, you know, it, it contextually carries more weight with your peers also. Mm -hmm. So we, we actually, I think that's very important too, trying to facilitate and help others who are researchers um, to you know, pick up the torch. I mean, uh, you can't have too many researchers, right? You can't have too many people researching online learning and researching good pedagogy. So if if we can try to you know toot that horn and, and add more people to the band, um, the song is better. Boy, there's a lot wrapped up in there. I don't know what. <laughs> what, is, what does Chuck but, say? <laughs> Uncollected data can't be analyzed. Something Correct. Like that. Yeah. Yes. So we can always choose to ignore data we've collected, but uncollected data cannot be, you know, cannot be analyzed. Definitely. And you right know, now, I think we have so much data available to us too. So definitely. So. You no. Know, um, maybe some of our listeners think, well, gee whiz, I, you know, I don't have Dr. Patsy Moskal at 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 my elbow. Uh, I don't even know where I would start. I mean, it, it occurs to me we could certainly plug the work of our colleagues over at Oregon State University. They've got that great disciplinary efficacy research database, which I, I've pointed people to left and right, especially folks who were kind of asking, forgive me, but kind of naive questions, right, about, well, gee, I don't know. Yeah, but do you have anything from discipline X? Because I, I, I don't listen to discipline Y, Z, A, Q, and R, you know, discipline X. Well, yes, we do. Here's, here are a series of, of studies or, or whatnot. I think there's that's also a great another, resource. There's an online resource at the University of Florida that grew out of the, the online strategic plan here in the, uh, for the state university system. 
Um, and, and maybe we can provide a link to that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, I think it's mostly uh, from Florida institutions. Mm -hmm. I mean, Patsy's got a lot of stuff in there when I've searched for UCF <laughs> contributions to that. Um, but uh, that might be useful to people as well. I, I was just thinking, I was partly that was a, a legitimate plug, but partly it was also setting up this question. Patsy, I wonder what kind of biases against actual <laughs> research findings and data have you in have you encountered like I mentioned one right like oh, I only listen to people from my discipline <laughs> but what other kind of biases have you run into through the years well I mean I I think you could argue that just the notion that face-to-face -face is better than online mm -hmm. learning is kind of the inherent you know bias that we've we've encountered from from the beginning um, it you know we, and I, we've we've kind of said well why is face to face the gold standard, right? I mean, as we know, there are, you know, it's a continuum. There's a whole lot of different um, instructional methods that occur in classes, no matter what modality. So there's a there's a wide range of uh, quality, um, and, and and there is the problem. How do you how do you measure quality, right? So within face to face, within online, um, you know, questioning whether sitting in the back of a 300 seat lecture hall listening to a you know straight lecture is that necessarily um, as helpful as maybe an online very active um, engaging um, you know uh, lesson that your 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 experienced online faculty member knows how to how to carry um, using a lot of online resources so um, biases you know. Um, do they cheat online? Um, it, you know, I, I think that's a that's a big one. Um, obviously, we're all slightly different, so class size does it matter? You know, there there are a lot of things that can impact what is perceived as quality or maybe how you teach. So just being careful to uh, to be aware of those and try to compare and and get the best research you can, the best data you can, I think is really critically important, if that makes sense. Um, I wonder if um, if maybe, you know, to Kelvin's point that that people who might look at, at a, 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 an organization like like the Research Initiative for Teaching Effectiveness, uh, you know, you and and Dr. Jubin, and you've got a couple of research assistants, typically that, that graduate assistants that, that help you, that that just seems sort of out of reach for somebody who might be a one-person shop, and you know how how can they potentially engage with with their faculty or with with instructional designers or others on campus to try to get at some of this research, whether it's scholarship of teaching and learning or kind of best practice or just efficacy research, um, kind of starting you know small. Do you do you have any kind of advice yeah. for them? Definitely, you know, I mean, that's that's one of the things that that I talk about often because, you know, there's the argument, well, I can't do what you do because I, I don't have the resources, we don't have any money, all of the all of those, you know, typical. And I mean, come on, none of us have enough resources and none of us have enough money, right? We could all use more. Um, we're just at different levels. But one of the things I try to encourage is that look for what you do have access to, right? So, um, you know, Librarians are masterful at helping you do lit reviews. So go find a librarian friend that will help you try to find what other people have done in the area in with whatever pedagogical, you know, innovation you're trying to research. So whatever the research topic is, what have other people done? Learn from what they've done and try to try to get a plan for your design. And then look at what kind of data do you have access to that's very easy to capture. So there's you know, in terms of data collection, some things are automatic. So on our campus, um, you know, it, every every campus has some kind of institutional research office or a person or something. So there is data collected on your students as a function of them coming into the university, filling out some form, which is, you know, on online now. So that's captured in a database. So th those data will let you look at student demographics and also GPA, how they're doing in your class. If you're teaching, you've got your, you know, if you're teaching online, there's definitely online data. So there's your grade book and all of the um, 
you know, all of the assignments, the exams, the quizzes, whatever you have. And, and typically there's some, some kind of analytics that you can, you can get access to easily. Um, at UCF, in terms of student perception, we have, you know, a student ratings form. Most um, universities, or at least a lot of them, have some version that is, is automatically um, triggered near the end of the semester. So, and, and you know, there's a, there's a lot of research and, and controversy on whether or not to use student ratings, but it is out there and it is a data collection mechanism that, you know, is, is automatic for us. So we also find for some of our faculty, it can be very high stakes. So if it's used in promotion and tenure, or it's used in you know, some award structure, it's important to still look at it. And I think the key is not to capture one moment in time, but look at the trends. So if you've made some changes to your course, hmm. you can look at some of the historical, you know, all right, well, here's how I did the last academic year. Here's what happened after I made those changes. You know, now, now uh, do I don't notice any, any difference, that kind of stuff. So there's some easy to capture data. And then I actually tell people, you know, there are experts in research on your campus. So, you know, seek them out, find mm-hmm. your educational research folks, mm-hmm. find those who are maybe in psychology or sociology or some of the, you know, some of the disciplines where they know research, they can actually do some of the statistical, if you're not a, if, you know, statistical tests aren't really your thing or you feel like you're weak in that, find somebody who's strong and partner with them. Um, you know, I find it's, it always, I think it always strengthens my research when I work with someone else who actually, you know, stretches my thought, right? Mm-hmm. So they really provide a different perspective. It can help me improve on what I'm, what I'm already doing. So it's like, find what you do have access to. You don't have yeah. to do the scale of a UCF, but, you know, start small and grow a little at a time and learn from, um, you know, learn from the, every time you do a re-up your research project, all right, we'll use your lessons learned to inform the, you know, the next model. Um, and, and I think it's, there, there are, there is no limit in terms of, well, it's too small to do this, this kind of research, pro- you know, do what you can do. And I think it's really still important to put that in place, if that makes sense. Yeah, mm-hmm. great. I, I do want to reinforce, underline one thing that I heard you say in there, Patsy, before we begin to kind of wrap up. And and I think, like you said, find the educational research people at your institution. Um, and kind of back to that concept of bias for a second. I know I've run across, maybe it's been a while since I've personally run across folks with this mindset, but maybe, maybe in the furor that uh, Tom mentioned with like <laughs> new, robust, rigorous, shiny studies, um, maybe this will come up again. I've heard in the past, uh, I'm sure you have, Patsy, folks who want to only deal with like laboratory studies, you know, only pristine, clean room kind of environments, you know, testing, you know, exact uh, instructional methodology as as opposed to educational researchers who are used to, I don't know, here's a metaphor, studying things in the wild, you know, like, you know, imperfect settings, you know, unmatched data, that sort of, that sort of thing. I thought that was a very good point. Educational researchers are used to doing that. Um, yeah, pure absolutely. research is Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're looking for a laboratory where you can sterilize everything and keep it very clean, <laughs> this ain't it. You're, you're going to be sorely disappointed. So Kelvin, mm-hmm. um, the, the coffee has, has, wound down yes. and um, and I, uh, I think the clock is ticking yes. towards the bottom of the hour here. So um, Patsy, thank you so much for, mm-hmm. for joining us and being on Topcast. This is probably a long time coming uh, oh, yeah. given, given how often we, <laughs> we invoke you and your research and, mm-hmm. and all the work that you do. So you know, we, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Well, I really enjoy it. And, and you know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that I did notice that my colleague, Dr. Chuck Jubin, was on episode 48. This is episode 96, correct? So that would be two times 48, which of course is not a, his favorite prime number. But I expect like every 48 episodes, you'll get one of us here, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's cool. So, Calvin, do we have time for a plug? Uh, before we plug, can we just kind of wrap up the bottom line oh, yes. and then we'll see what we can do? Absolutely. I forgot take, to put I'll the take, landing gear down. I'll take the bottom line if you take the plug. Sounds good. All right. Uh, impact evaluation and research are crucial aspects of our work as online education professionals. We need to know whether we're being effective. And faculty and students and other stakeholders, well, they want to see evidence of efficacy before engaging or before continuing or before uh, getting further into it. So the work uh, that Patsy and colleagues across our whole field are doing, absolutely uh, imperative. How's that? Absolutely, yes, true that. All right, so our plug. Mm -hmm. um, as you recall, because you're the one that told me, um, <laughs> we, we have discovered that there are various versions sort of of, of like the Apple uh, podcast mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. data and um, one for each country. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've been pretty good about monitoring the, the U.S., but we haven't been as good about looking at some of our listeners who are not in the U.S. And, and we have discovered another international TopCast listener who's left a review uh, for us. Um, so this comes from our neighbors to the north, eh, mm -hmm. up in Canada. <laughs> and it's a listener with the screen name of, I'm going to call it Gursky, mm -hmm. but it's G-U-R-5-K-Y. So mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm reading that five as an S, Gursky. Yeah, so uh, Gursky says, Incredibly generous of Thomas and Kelvin to share their deep experience on technology-mediated teaching and learning in such a pithy, digestible format. Great guests, too. Hey, as evidenced by today's guest, right? Absolutely. That's Thanks, cool. Thanks, Gursky. Uh, very kind of you. Mm -hmm. eh? We really appreciate it. Um, so you, uh, dear listener, if you're listening to this now and you, and you kind of like what you hear, take a moment. Go visit your podcast app of choice and maybe give us a rating and a review. It, it mm -hmm. does help the algorithms, I'm told, mm -hmm. uh, and helps people who are looking for this sort of content find it more easily if there's engagement from the community. So we don't get anything from it, but we're trying to help the community. So thank you for those who have given us ratings and reviews. And if you do send one, maybe you'll get read on the air and get that shout out uh, for you know all what? your friends to hear. It, it makes us feel nice too. Yeah, there's somebody out there listening besides our moms, right? Yeah. All right. So uh, thank you for the coffee, Kelvin. Uh, mm -hmm. And thank you to Patsy for joining us today and for such a great conversation. Mm -hmm. Until next time for TopCast, I'm Tom. I'm Kelvin. See ya. See ya.